Hello all you hardcore boxing fans out there, how you doing? It's Big Pork here, the voice of hardcore boxing. I'm just going to call my friend Terry Chapandama and get him on the channel. There we go. Hello. How you doing Terry? I'm alright mate, how are you? How, how are your hardcore boxing fans? <laughs> I'm alright mate, we've, uh, we're glad to have you on the channel. We've just had Rico on for part one and we're going to go for Terry for part two. That's the main event then. Main event, our kids. Then we're going to switch it to pay per view. <laughs> no, Stig's pay per view. <laughs> now, Stig is sticking in answering my calls these days, so he sacked me, I think. He's gone big time on me. I listen, then. Stig powers on my forward. Stig, not it's not Fury power no more, it's Stig power, isn't it? He should have always been Stig power. Yeah, I told him, I said, change it from Fury Power because you're upsetting the powers that be. <laughs> he says, what do you mean? I says, you need to change it or you might end up on a caravan site one night stripped off. Anyway, the next day he changed it to Stig Power. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And I bet his numbers have gone up now because people are more interested in the Stig right now. Yeah, they're more interested in the Stig they are than you <laughs> Yeah, I fucking know, I can say that. I say what I want, don't I? I just tell it as I see it, don't I? <laughs> now, I, 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 I don't hammer you, we do I as a pal, but he shouldn't have fought that Norad, should he? That would awful, wasn't it? Hey, haven't you got Samuel Peter coming up? Samuel Peter, I know, yeah, I know what you're going to say, but did you see my interview with Dennis? And he said, look, You've got to look at it like this, Samuel Peters, a former champion, WBC, and he's got four wins over champions, hasn't he? Two wins over James Tony. Okay, so... It'll beat Holyfield. See, but you see, that, that's, uh, that's when things become pointless when you talk boxing. Yeah, I know, yeah. Sam Peters has been washed up for a while. And yeah, he has, yeah. he fought was just eating burgers, and I mean, probably just eating Nando's and drinking beer. He wasn't really training, he was just like, right, I'll show up for some money. Yeah, well, he's up, that's up to the people that pass him to have a licence then, isn't it, really? Listen, I don't mind having a licence, I just don't think it's good for Huey. You know, Huey Fury is now of that generation where he should be calling out guys like Nathan Gorman. He should be saying, I want the winner of Gorman Dubois or I want Joey Joyce. I just call out people who are of your generation yeah. in terms of boxing. Yeah, I'd like to see Huey Fury against Nathan Gorman, Joyce, or oh, who's the other one? Even Dave Allen. Dave Allen. Dave, yeah, but Dave, Dave's done over 500 rounds with you, and he's sparring, and he he, he knows what to come, what's to, to come, doesn't he? That's a different Dave, man. I saw a few pictures of him training. Dave, he's in, he's in, he's in different conditions, so yeah. it's a different story. I don't know. Yeah. Dave hasn't fought anyone we care about domestically since Nick Webb, right? Yeah. And even then we barely cared about Nick Webb, so it's really the Dillian fight that we're, we're looking at Dave in relation to at the moment. Yeah, so, so if Huey's got to get in the mix in terms of his own visibility, that's the mix he should be getting in right now. Yeah. It's another Hennessy disaster, let's call it what it is. It's Hennessy not really understanding what his fighting needs, again. Yeah, yeah, you could say that, couldn't you? Yeah, Huey needs a war. He, he, needs, he needs that fight where we go, he just went to the well, and he came out and won. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, you could be right there. You could be... Uh, I had, do you know what, though? The more I think about it, right, I've only seen you in, in a couple of fights where he's gone to the well. One Once were the... The guy who, who, who cut him really bad. Uh, Pulev. No, not Pulev. The other one, he had, he had a, he had a, he had a cut. Uh, I'd have to go on to Boxrec. Let me just have a look on Boxrec here, because I'm casual nowadays. I forgot his name. He like a Billy Goat. He's like, he was like the Sakia Beaker of the heavyweight division. So it's not Fred Cassie. Is it? Fred Cassie, yeah, Fred Cassie. Fred Cassie cut him, didn't he? You were bad. 
And he managed to get through that fight against Fred Cassidy, but he was really, really cut bad, really bad, mate. And uh, yeah, Fred Cassidy, brown bread Fred. Uh, and just one of them things, I suppose. But uh, but I, I hope that Yui uh, gets a, gets gets a few quid out of the job. I think they're just treading water and hoping for the offers to come in. Do you know what I mean? But the offers are coming in. I know they're not going to come in, but if so, it, it, it could be. You know, like uh, Rivers gets injured, we're weak to go. Does Yui want the fight? Yes or no? Because I know Peter's on speaking terms with Eddie Earn at the moment. So if Rivers is injured. Who's to say you won't be slipped in, or vice versa? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. He, that's the only way I can see him get getting uh, getting anywhere at the moment. I don't. But they've never, they've never tried to make him relevant. If you look at the first half of his career, he was Tyson Fury's cousin, right? Yeah. And then that kind of died down, and then he went and became his own man, and then it just all fell away. So now it's like, well. What are we getting excited about? You know, apart from that, that YouTube pay-per-view disaster. That's pretty much all we know Huey for. And he's too talented to be known just for that. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, I wonder, I'm wondering where Huey goes from here at the moment, like, to be honest. Well, hopefully away from Hennessy. That will be a good start. Yeah, do you think? It's not doing anything for a minute. Well, I mean, no Mick Ennis is not promoting him, is he? Like we, like we want, like he has other people, is he? Look, when you're a fighter, I imagine all you really want are the big events that you're going to remember, that you can tell your kids about. And Fred Cassie, Billy Nobody, Samuel Peter, aren't really what you get excited about. He wants more of those sort of Joseph Parker type events. But then I ask myself, are they really putting the work in to achieve that? Yeah. Yeah, I suppose, yeah, I mean, Yui, right? What 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 were Yui's what's Yui's best win in the last five years? Oh, no, Savannah Marshall in the 100 meter sprint. Hmm. <laughs> You'd say Redenko's his best win, wouldn't you? You his best win in the last four years. I tell you what, I'll say, I, I will say this. We're all going to look back on 2019 and go, everyone regrets not fighting Dimitrenko now. He was always available. He was like number five in the IBF. He sat around there for years and no one wanted to fight him. And that was just easy ranking points. Uh, he wasn't very good to begin with, and he was just, it was an easy one. Ruiz gets that, he gets that win. Look at that, straight to the Joshua fight. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I suppose, yeah, you could say that, couldn't you? Yeah, you could say that. And he, uh, he quit in fifth round, didn't he, Dimitrenko? Yeah, it just, Sometimes in the boxing, just like I already got my money. What's the point? Yeah, he was 19 stone too, Andy Ruiz against Joshua. Well, you know, you know all about that, so you understand. Like you, you don't lose your speed when you get to that side. <laughs> you twat! <laughs> <laughs> Did you have Ruiz beating Joshua Terry? Nope. We didn't, did we? No, no, I don't believe for one second anyone did. Even Joshua Sparrow partners didn't. Now you just, you couldn't see how. But I think I said this when we did our podcast about it. All we did was confirm every rumor we'd ever heard about Joshua. Round yeah. by round, we're like, oh, they really were protecting Joshua in Sheffield. They yeah. really were controlling the game by Joshua in Sheffield. Because you can see that, and I know people say, 
uh, he got hit over the top of the head. And, uh, that, that's all well and good, but I've seen guys get hit like that. And they're scratching and they're crawling on the floor and they're pulling themselves up on the ropes and they're grabbing the referee goes, do not stop this fight. And unfortunately, when AJ just said, do you know what? I'm done. Have you seen Teddy Atlas's explanation on why he quit? I can't bear that man, man. He's, he's, he's impossible to listen to. But he's saying that it got to a stage where Joshua just didn't want it no more. He, 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 he's had it that he's had it that easy. You know, he's had free gifts at the Olympics. He was gifted an IBF against Charles Martin. He's had it all his own way. That he's in another country and he's not having it his own way. And somebody's swarming all over him with speed and quite a bit. I'm not saying he's a Mike Tyson-esque power, but he was. He's, he, do, he touches you enough to hurt you, he doesn't he, Louise? Uh, he's the reason I can't buy what Teddy Atlas says. Wow. In the Olympics, he only got two gifts. Eris Landis of Vaughan, Roberto Camarelli. They were the only gifts he got. You yeah. know? If you go, yeah, he deserves to go through. But yeah, if, he, if, if the decision had gone the right way against the Vaughan, there'd be no Joshua Miracle story. That's the reality of it. Yeah, that is the reality of it. So basically, Joshua, from getting caught with drugs and McCracken going to court for him, to the gift at the gift at the Olympics, the first gift. Who was, who, who was the first one? Landy, where is? Savon. Savon, Felix, that's it, Savon. Yeah, to the to the Savon fight, he had two lots of luck there, and then he would he had gifts all the way through to the to the Charlie Martin fight, didn't he? Well, they hand-picked the bonus. Hand-picked, yeah. Hand-picked, all chosen at the right time, all of that good stuff. And, and uh, listen, I have no issue with that. They were, they were building someone who hadn't really boxed a lot, and they were like, look, he's got to learn on the job before he can fight for titles. And I believe them. And that point, I was like, I get it. I 100% get it. Because I was hearing things. Like, when he was down at the Sims gym, my friend spotted him. And he's like, I was like, what was it like? He's like, eh, he's got a long way to go. And so none of those faults were ever fixed. But the mistake they made was jump on that Charles Martin fight. Because once you've got a belt, the learning's over. You're a world champion. You can't tell me you're still learning. And he still needed to learn. Yeah. And that's basically where they went wrong, isn't it? Do you think the first chinks, Terry, were when they signed Luis Ortiz and, and everybody thought they were going to fight Luis Ortiz because he was ranked number one and Joshua were chasing. And then they jumped from the WBC when they were told they were going to be mandatory and a year for Wilder. Do you think when they jumped from then, do you think that's when we all sussed on they were hiding glass? Because um, Ortiz was still active then, wasn't he? You, you, you play a very dangerous game when you say heavyweights are hiding glass in their chin because they can all detonate on each other's chin. I think it wasn't so much that, it was more... They didn't want Joshua in hard fights. I don't think the chin was the issue. They didn't want to take miles off the Joshua clock. So they gave him opponents that wouldn't take miles off him. That was a challenge. And I, look, if we just fast forward quickly to Ruiz, they didn't expect Ruiz to put miles on that Joshua clock. Sadly, he's just basically, he's taken that, he's taken Joshua, done about half an hour worth of handbrake turns, some burnouts, double dip the clutch, and then just rammed it into a lamp post and gone home and had dinner. Like, yeah. he's basically physically ruined Joshua. You know, mate, I'll tell you what, I can watch all the videos of Joshua doing his training and stuff, and I say to myself, we are doing all of that before. It's, what are you going to do differently against Ruiz? Yeah, it's going to be interesting, isn't it? I mean, all, all them training videos he was doing on his YouTube channel and all that, they've, they've maximised every single penny, haven't they? 
from 15 blue chip companies to even a YouTube channel doing people like Coogan out of money. <laughs> yeah, all these people in the YouTube channel, I don't know what the world's coming to. <laughs> well, this is how I look at it, Terry, right? It all bits him in arse because they were concentrating on money more than learning his craft. So see, bro, the thing is, when you get a lad in at 18 years old, what you really can't teach him is defense. It's, uh, it's, it's almost impossible. You just write it off because defense takes years of getting it wrong before you figure out how to... Because, look, you put, you put two guys in the ring, like, I could, let me take you, Russ, on one side in the red corner, and I could pull a Paul Hindley in the blue corner, right? <laughs> yeah, it'd be a bloodbath, mate. I don't have to train either of you, right? You could just go out to the middle of that ring and swing punches, right? Yeah. You already know how to do that. Yeah. What I can't teach you is how to read the other guy. So I can't teach you how to know when he's faint, when he's going to faint, know when he's going to punch you, know where you're going to put your head, know how to draw the lead. All these small, subtle things that you learn from when you're 11 years old, onwards and upwards in the game, are very hard to teach when someone's 18. So Joshua will never be a real big technician like the so he just won't be. Or an Andy Ruiz. I mean, Ruiz, his record sort of slipped us all by because we were looking at his physique. I mean, when I looked at his amateur record after the event, I thought, God, how did I miss it? You know, it's there in black and white, isn't it? And I'm supposed to be a stat man. I mean, I know people, right, who, who are, uh, how can I explain it, straight people who, who, who watch boxing on Skank, they pay for the pay-per-view, and they were texting me saying, look at the state of these on weighing, you know, at the weighing, Andy Ruiz, Joshua, and, and their husband or this wife were saying, yeah, but he didn't look frightened that Andy Ruiz is staring him straight in the eye, if anything, I think Joshua knew the game were up before they fought. I mean, hindsight's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And we can see all the clues now. We can now look back at that fight and we can go, why was Joshua bone dry? Why hadn't he walked up? He's got a change room full of 80 people, whatever it is they've got in there. No one person's had a set of pads to warm it up. Or even just have your hands down. So the, the, the light bulb starts to go up in your head, which says, well, if he hasn't warmed up and there's not a bead of sweat on him, I bet he wasn't sweating when he got his hands wrapped up. So the Ruiz corner were like, I think something's up with Joshua, because you get to really, you get to look deep into someone's eyes when they get in their hands wrapped. And I think they knew then that there was something not right with Joshua. But I don't want to say something's not right with Joshua, because it gives him a way out of his defeat, which we yeah. shouldn't give him. Yeah. He, he got beaten up. Yeah. Like, got it was like, it was like a steak after two hours with a tenderizer. Mm. He was like a surgeon, Ruiz, wasn't he going to work? I was, no, 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 no. It was, a lot of it was pretty clumsy. <laughs> but what it was, was it was quick. Like, Joshua just couldn't see that, he, he couldn't cope with the hand speed. They clearly had to prepare for that. This, the, but what I like about Ruiz is, he doesn't load up, but he whips those shots in. He's like, he's like a wilder, not with a far shot around. He whips the shots in, so he hurts, not because the punches are heavy, but because they come in so fast that you, you just don't, number one, you can't see it. And then number two, it's that speed. And once that speed connects with you, that's, 
of hell on earth. Yeah. What did you think about his corners uh, performance on the night? Robert McCracken and Mark Seltzer and all them boys in corner. Because there were. Uh, did you, Did you notice how they had four men in the corner? And normally they only got two, aren't they? You, you normally, you know, you normally have three. Oh, sorry, three. Sorry, yeah, sir. Yeah. Uh, what do you do, Russell? I want to ask you. You did you can see that your lad's gone. There's no point in trying to give him the. The complex tactical advice he needs to turn the fight around because he can't take it in. And you could you could tell in the corner, Rob was trying to was just trying to reach it. Never mind giving him advice. It was like, wait, you still in there? So, well, we had the same problem with Carl Froch against George Groves in the first fight, if you remember, where he couldn't get through to Carl until after the hammering in the six when he he would hit that hard, it woke him up. Now, Carl were just. He, he was like he said he felt like his legs were on jelly. He was just going through the emotions. He couldn't hear anything, but everything was just you know there in in front of him. But and he kept getting hit. He said just as I was just about to clear my head, he hit me again and again. And I think that's what happened with Joshua. Yeah, and the big difference with Joshua is Carl came up. He served his apprenticeship in in the Lennox Books Boxing Academy under Howard Eastman. Yeah. So he went through that, and, and this is what, I guess this is what people don't understand. You need to be buzzed a few times in your career. Like, I've, I've had it when I've jumped in with mates and with the boxing, and I've just caught a, a hard shot. What you learn over months and years is actually there's a process you go through. If you notice, when Ruiz got dropped... He was cool as a cucumber when he got dropped. Exactly, because it's happened to him before. So he goes through the process in his head, he's like, right, forget that's happened, stick to your boxing. And that's all he did. Yeah. Do you know what Dennis said to me when when he got it? Uh, when Joshua gets dropped, he likes to he tries to play poker with him by smiling, doesn't he? Yeah. And, I, and Dennis says that's when they've been hurt, when they're doing that, when they're playing the poker face. You know, it's a waste of time. You, 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 you have to have a process that you know off by heart before you get dropped. Yeah. Fury had it. If you notice, when he got dropped in the top against Wilder, Fury knew where he was, he knew what happened, and he knew what he had to do. Why? Because he's been dropped a few times before. Yeah. And that's what, that's what, that's what they've done. They're not in protecting Joshua. They've denied him those learning opportunities. When he were getting dropped against David Price, they never had him back again. When a Coley dropped him, he he, he were never back again. He went pro, didn't he? Who were the other kid? Who, who were the kid who dropped him? And well, all of a sudden he signed with Warren. What Dubois? Dubois. They got rid of him, didn't they? Never sparred him again, did he? I look. You know what? I have a feeling more people have dropped him. I wouldn't be surprised if Coley's dropped him. I wouldn't be surprised if other guys have come over from Europe and dropped him would not be surprised. And being told not to say anything. Well, no, I don't even think that it's just, it's, it's bad for business to say anything because you're like, I want to go with the Joshua undercard. So if, if you want to know who's been giving Joshua hell and sparring, just look at what heavyweights get on Joshua shows. Mm. Takam, there's an example. Yeah. Has Takam dropped Joshua? Probably. Yeah, you probably could, you're probably right there, Terry, because it's a business, isn't it? We all want to keep everybody sweet, don't we? We know how it works, don't we? Look, if someone said to me, Terry, you got to go spar Joshua, yeah? Yeah. Whatever happens, as long as you keep your mouth shut, we're going to get you on this pay-per-view card. Why am I going to talk? You're not going to do, are you? No. Nope. I'm going to get my money. And what happens to Joshua if... It he fights Ruiz again. Now, I've just spoke to Rico and I spoke to Dennis this morning at length and Dennis says he's heard it's not set in stone, that rematch for this year, you know. I don't think it is. I, I, I think, here's my theory of what's happened. They were so sure that Joshua was going to win. They've just said, yeah, we, we also include the right for Joshua to have a rematch. And there's nothing else. I don't imagine that clause is any longer than that. So I don't imagine that they, I don't imagine that Hearn has the right to choose the venue, the date, the purses, the purse split. 
I imagine someone dropped the ball on that contract, and that's why it's not all confirmed. Because they're sat there going, look, this contract's not worth the paper it's written on. Ruiz quite fancies the fight. Why not? But ask an even deeper question. Well, well yeah. When, when you're Anthony Joshua and you're sat at home on your own, no one else is there, it's not boxing, it's just you and your young lad, and you're just sat there, it's quiet and it's peaceful. You have to remember that you got battered from pillar to post and you didn't stand and trade. You couldn't even stand and trade. Do you want to go through that again? No, you don't. You won't want to do it. No, I don't think, I don't think he does, I don't think he does, and I don't think this fight's going to happen. Do you know what I see happening? And like I said, I spoke to somebody today, I'm not going to mention his name, but he said to me, he said, them belts, Eddie Hearn's trying to get them split up, the WBA and the IBF, they're trying to fragment them belts. Do you know what I mean? Oh yeah, because he wants to retain control. Yeah, that's it, he wants them. But he was saying he wanted one champion of the week. Well, no, no, he wanted Joshua to be that one champion. If yeah. it's going to be Joshua, then screw it. Yeah, get all the belts uh, split up and, and we'll fuck the fans' heads up again. But Have you... that, that was always going to happen. I never believed that boxing wanted one You did champion. say that. You have been saying that for a few years now that them belts, so there's never going to be one champion, not even for one fight. So we could say that there's one man. No, no, because that doesn't do anyone any favours. That concentrates the money in one person, and no one wants that. Because look, let's go through it, right? If the belts scatter, it will be Deontay Wilder being chased by Dillian White, right? Then it will be the WBA, and I imagine that will be someone fighting Trevor Bryant. They'll get Joseph Parker in there fighting Trevor Bryant for the WBA. For the IBF, it will have to be two minutes against someone, but that's a, that's a Bob Aaron though. So you might just pull up or fight someone, maybe, maybe even fight Fury, but, because they've never actually ranked anyone in number two, so you could easily do that if the dog is good. And then you've got Usyk for the WBO against somebody. But they'll keep that in the in the ecosystem as well. You could even have Usyk against Joshua. You could have Parker against Joshua for the WBA and rebuild Joshua that way. Yeah. Yeah, you could. It's a, it's going to be a bit of a, a mess, and we were so close to getting it. And, I, and I'm, I'm now angry at Eddie Hearn for not making the Wilder fight when they had the fifty million offer. They were never going to do that. They knew Josh would get beat. Yeah. There's more, there's more in in rebuilding Joshua by having him not even have this rematch. Just going, you know what? Let Ruiz have his time, right? He defeated Josh or whatever. Now look, he's got three mandatory he's got to hit in a row. Yeah. And they're not, they're not all Heyman controlled fighters. That's the problem. Hearn was going to set it up so he had all the guys that were going to challenge Joshua. Keep all the money in house. But that's all out the window now. So Hearn's basically got um, all these heavyweights that he was lining up with Joshua to fight. Now he's got to work out how they all fight each other. So he doesn't lose in all of this. Hearn just doesn't lose. No, because he's got Usyk and White, and it up his sleeve. Usyk, White, Parker, Chisora. He's working with Spilka now, so maybe Spilka's involved in all Tack of them. Michael Hunter. Don't forget Michael Hunter. Tackham, Dave Allen. Yeah, Price. Yeah, he's, he's, got, he's in the mix, isn't he? But out of all them, I see Usek being the best now, out of all Eddie's Evies. We need to see him. I think we just need to see him battle, battle test as well. What's he like taking a shot from a 240 pound man? Yeah. If he, if he takes it, no problem, then yeah, the world's in trouble. Yeah. He did well against Joyce, didn't he? Uh, both styles make fights. Joyce is tailor made for him. Yeah, do you think Joshua's tailor made for all sec? Uh, perhaps. Then, Joshua's kryptonite is combination.
attention unto. That's his kryptonite. If if you are smart enough, because remember, if you watch any Joshua fight, that like he he peeled every layer of Joshua's soul bare, man. Joshua's soul was there for us all to see when he was hanging on those ropes at the end of the fight, and you just said, "Nah, this has been as comprehensive and dismantling as I've ever seen." Yeah, it was, wasn't it? It was sad to see in a way. I mean, I'm not a big Joshua fan, mainly because of all the hype that they've given him. Because we know we, we know about his story and who we were fighting and blah de blah. But the man in the street doesn't know. And when I was having the man in the street come up to me and saying he's better than Ali and stuff like that, and he's bigger and faster than Ali, and what would Ali have done to him? We stopped him. What would Mike Tyson have done to him? Who? Mike Tyson. I think Joshua gives Tyson a hard fight. I think anyone does. Yeah? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sold in the myth of Mike Tyson. What about Lennox? Lennox stops him violently, horribly. What do you think about people, including me, saying that Joshua was another Michael Grant? And so they, they do this thing, they do a special on Michael Grant. And the first thing he says is, I never wanted to box. So his dad forced him into boxing. He turned out to be good at it because he was so scared of getting beaten at home. So he fought his nuts off and turned to be pretty good. But once he became an adult, he realized he didn't ever want to box. And so you saw that in his fights. Like, sometimes he'd be so scared that he just knocked the guy out by accident. But when, he was, when the pressure was on him, he folded. And so he, he quit boxing, and now he's like a theatre director. Jeez, I didn't know that. Yeah, so I don't know if he's like Joshua. I'm trying to think who Joshua is. Joshua's got a touch of the Audrey Harrison about him. <laughs> That's what I always feel when I see Joshua. I just see that, that guy that just, whatever it is you need to be heavyweight champion in a meaningful way. Anthony Joshua doesn't have it in it. And you can't manufacture it. You can't you can't create it in a lab. You can't create it at EIS. You can't Google for it. You can't find it on Box Rec. There's just something in you that you've either got it or you haven't. And Joshua hasn't got that thing. Yeah. And and the funny thing is about Michael Grant up to him fighting Lennox Lewis. It, it basically, it blitzed everybody out of there, hasn't it? Yeah, because am I right that he beat, did he beat Tommy Morrison for the belt? Uh, no, I don't think it, no, I don't think he won the belt at all. I don't think he won the belt. He won an eliminator against Galotto. In Glotto, he knocked him out in 10th. He beat Lou he Savarese. No, he never won a belt. Michael Grant never won a world title. He beat... Uh, he, he, he was the IBC champion, he was the NABBA champion, uh, he won a WBC eliminated against Galotta, uh, he beat Lionel Butler, he beat him, he beat all, you know, B class, he beat Ross Purity, I don't think Ross Purity, he, he knocked out Cory Sanders and Ross Purity and of course they ended up beating Vladimir, didn't they? <laughs> he knocked them out, he made quick work of them. Well, it actually was a decision on purity, but he knocked Cora Sanders out in two rounds. Um, and it, it was just blitzing through everybody, and he ran into, he ran into Lennox Lewis, and, he, and the odds were they won't give him much away on him, and everybody were like, this is Lennox Lewis, it's all going to be over for Lennox Lewis, and obviously Lennox... Uh, no, because it was the end of his career. Um, yeah. Lennox ended up doing a number on him, didn't he? He knocked him down quite a few times. He only had six more fights, Lennox. For another, he only fought for another two and a half more year. But no, shame, no shame in getting knocked out by Lennox Lewis. No, no, is it right? Grant, he was down three times in round one, Grant, and, and then again in round two. But, uh, yeah, I think that's the time he was just like, look, I wasn't enjoying it. It wasn't what I wanted to do. 
Yeah, probably. Oh, Lennox. No, Michael Grant. Oh, Michael Grant. Oh, is that what he said in the documentary? Yeah. Anyway, people should watch it. It's an interesting documentary. I think it's just it's called The Losers on Netflix. Well, I'm going to watch that today, actually, because uh, Michael Grant, I were on the Michael Grant hype train, I thought he looked the part, he was knocking people out, and, you know, everybody was saying he, he, he'd, uh, he fought Lennox after the Holyfield rematch, didn't he? When Lennox yeah. had got the bit between his teeth. Do you know what I mean? And um, But, but yeah, but, but anyway, moving on from that, let's go to the MTK show. What did you Great. think to it? The we'll start off with O'Hara Davis. Uh, so he fought Miguel Vasquez, right? Yeah. And former world champ. But but, but you're not fighting him because he's a former world champ. You're fighting him because he's a name. It's just yeah. a name on your CV now to to get you your ranking points. The that the Vasquez that showed up on Friday. <laughs> Is a shadow of the man that once was, which is okay. Um, and I understand, what, you know, I understand the game. It's what you do. I thought, you know, people are saying Vasquez was robbed. I don't think he was. Uh, I wasn't a dominant winner, but would you say he won? I thought he was in control of the fight, so I had no issue with him winning. It wasn't a vintage performance. He says he broke his rib. I, I'm willing to believe that, but. I, I'm biased as well because I quite like O'Hara as a human being. I think he's a genuinely good young man. Yeah, who's just, I like him as well. He's just trying to figure out the world he's in. Because <laughs> it's something I said to O'Hara probably before the Taylor fight. And I said, you have to learn how to cope with being liked, with being respected with people wanting to do things for you. Yeah. You can't always be aggressive and you can't always be cynical about things. Sometimes people want to help you because they like you and they like your story. And we just had a chat about that and I think he's slowly taking these sorts of things on board because there are a lot of people that really care about it and want him to do well. And so this win I think is a, it's a good boost for his career. I don't think there's any shame in a young man saying my only two losses are to Josh Taylor and Jack Cattrall. Because I believe Taylor is well, Taylor is a world champion. I believe he can unify. Mm. I think Jack Cattrall could fight for a world title. That's pretty decent company. Yeah, I agree with that. And you'd have to say that the Cattrall fight really could have gone either way, couldn't it? And I, I think O'Hara just needed a bit more belief. The thing I took away from watching that fight on Friday, Porky, to be real with you, was O'Hara needs to be fighting four times a year. Yeah, not four times in two years since he lost to Taylor. Yeah, so so let me let me explain how how the O'Hara thing grew, right? If you go back to about two thousand ten, before there was Porky's Corner on YouTube, yeah. before there was all this stuff, there was hardly any boxing content on YouTube, right? Yeah. And all you see would were like O'Hara Davis, Anthony Yard, and there'd be some other lads who were there as well like Junior Saba was there, Big Junior was there, a few of these young kids, and all they do is they put up their, their training videos. That's it. On YouTube, this is us training. Then they'd be like, we'll spy anyone, anywhere. Doesn't matter, we'll come to you. And they were good on their word. They went to every gym going and they spied whoever they could. And they were just young savages. And this is where the O'Hara Davis profile came from. And so, they built this thing. They were the first boxers to master YouTube. They were the first boxers to master Facebook video. They were the first boxers to master Instagram. And that's where they fought. That's why O'Hara and Anthony Yard are so popular because they were the first guys. So they'd do their video and all the kids in the gym would be talking about that video the day after. Yeah, it's an that. important legacy in British boxing. O'Hara Davis was like our first internet box, and I don't say that disrespectfully, I say it as the guy that cracked the internet and social media first. Yeah, interesting, like that. Yeah. Uh, to be honest with you, I've heard stories that he uh, is supposed to have brought Conor Ben's jaw. Um, 
No comment. No comment. It must be true then. <laughs> Well, do you think so? So you think O'Hara should not be so hard on himself because he's getting a lot of respect, isn't he, uh, for for saying he thought he lost? Yeah, but look, to take the W any way you can, right? I mean, yeah. Look, you know, there'll be times when it doesn't go in his favour. You know, and you didn't feel it went in his favour against Jack Capital, so you know, yeah. it swings the roundabout. Yeah. Yeah. Well, moving on then, uh, what did you think about uh, Ian John Lewis's performance on the night? Because he gave Ryan Welsh the the victory by six points against Paulin, and he gave it O'Hara by three points. Do you think it's time for Ian to pack up? Um, no, because you know, look, you know, Ian John Lewis has been involved in boxing a lot longer than you and I have been watching it. Like, yeah. he's, he's as old school as it comes, so I'm never about to disrespect the guys that were there before I was. Yeah. But I'll tell you where I did have an issue. He was scoring the Martin McDonough versus Danny Darko fight, right? Yeah. And he was arrested. Him. But he knows all of those trainers from the Martin McDonough camp. They're all, they're all mates. So I, I thought that was strange to officiate because normally you want someone who's, who's, who's not biased, right? Yeah. So I thought that was interesting. But in terms of his scorecards, as I say to you privately, Russ, I dare anyone to try and score a fight. Most of the time, you look at your scorecard at the end of a fight, you're like, that, that doesn't feel like, like the right number. Yeah. And for me, look, my test is this. Like, when you've got three judges, on, if, if there's consensus across all the judges for eight out of the 12 rounds, that's a good judging performance for me. Mm. Yeah, did you, did you think that Martin McDonough won? No. No, 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 no. no. I didn't. I, I didn't have him winning. And, and he, he gave it to the other, other guy, so... You know, that... He, I'm a big Martin McDonough fan, I like him as a person. I've known him since he was like 17. And just the fact that he's boxing as a pro is a miracle. Because he was a kid who was really talented, but didn't believe in himself. And so when the pressure came on, he'd just go into his shell and he wouldn't fight and he wouldn't throw punches. And to give him his credit, his trainer Billy Rumble just performed miracles with the guy. You know, got him, got him as far as having the GB assessment, and he was he was on the fringes of getting selected for the GB squad. So McDonough's no mug when it comes to what he's capable of. He he just needs to fill out physically. Like he's got to get that strength in somewhere, and then mm. he should be all right. But I imagine this defeat will set him up for a fight with a kid called Mason Smith, and that'll be a hell of a fight because they have a legitimate grudge, like it's personal between those two. Mm. Who, who do you see Terry coming out uh, t turning over this this before September in the new season who do you see turning over who, who's who's going to go all the way uh, always tricky to tell so before this season the only name I can really think of is probably Elliot Whale so there's a kid called Elliot Whale and he just walked out in Italy yesterday uh, you know he's a class act nice and tall for a well to weight can box well and he did alright over and uh, well for a light middle he's class but he was a few like you don't really get guys like Elliot I think Elliot had 100 amateur bouts so his experience is deep I think his ABA semi-finalist or court finalist this year just just a class act now I don't know what he's going to do in terms of going pro but he's earned the right to go pro on his own terms. So, good luck to the kid. Outside of that, I don't think there are any, there are no real big names to get excited about because they're all in GB. So they're all tied up till 2020. Mm. Yeah, moving on then. So, the MTK show, we've spoke about that. Anthony Yard, what next for Anthony Yard, Terry? Kovalev. He wants to go over that fight. You think it'll happen? If it doesn't, 
but you have to say Kovalev's worthy. Yeah. And who would have thought we'd say that? Yeah, I would have thought that. I mean, it's. Uh, I personally think that it's dragged on a bit, though, on it now. Well, the Russian money fell through, so they had an emergency first bid, what, two weeks ago? Yeah. So we'll see. But look, Yard's a good guy. Special talent. One of the hardest workers I can think of. I don't think he's missed a training session. And that's how I judge people. How many days training do you miss? Because that's when you're doing your learning. He hasn't missed any. Like Craig Richards, you know certain guys are always in the gym, always grafting and learning. Yeah. Is Craig Richards one of them? Yeah. 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 A lot of people slept on Craig for a long, long time. But if, I've known... I remember watching Craig back in 2012 when he was just a young kid training out at Terry Palmer's gym in South London. And quiet guy, unassuming guy, quite, you know, he's intelligent, you know, quite intellectual. He was quiet. He wasn't one of the the young savages. But you see him box and all his punches got a reaction out of his opponent. So he boxed in the circuit. And we didn't work together with Steve. And you can see he'd grown as a man, he was hitting harder, and he punches deceptively hard. He doesn't look like he should, but Craig Richards punches really hard. He can lock in style concussive. But round after round of what he gives you, he'll break you down. Yeah. Do you think that uh, Craig Richards will fight Boatsy? Um, I think he'd want to, but they'll move Boatsy on. Yeah. Where do you see Boatsy going next? Because he's got no fight lined up. I know he's just uh, fought last month, but... They'll put him on a show in September, I suspect. And mm. they will give him a name. It'll be someone like the guy that beat Cleverly. Jürgen Bremer. Yeah. It'll be someone like him that'll give to Boatz and say, this is your step-up fight. Didn't Cleverly beat, oh, Cleverly beat him, didn't he? Pardon? Didn't, didn't cleverly beat Bremer? I probably did. I probably got that one wrong. Yeah, I'm going to say, yeah, yeah, go on. But that's what you want to do. You, you, you want mm. him in with someone of that calibre, or maybe just a level below, just so we can go, right, this guy actually is world level. I'd like to see him against the guy that's not going to fall over. That's what I want to see next. Yeah, because he, I just, I'm just seeing him in knockover fights. I mean... You know, he's only just just before Christmas. He's fighting like Reynold Quinlan, who's a, who's a Korea middleweight, and Tony Avalanche, You know, and Andreas uh, Pekumiko. And, you know, these guys have got fourteen and ten losses and twenty eight losses last year. That Grafka, and do you yeah, know what I mean? The thing is, see, no, no. So, box will tell you one thing, right? But reality will often tell you something completely different. What they've been trying to do with Boat is get him guys that will give him rounds without having to throw him to the Lions just yet. The problem is Josh is a lot better than people realise. So he's he's taking these guys out so easily. He's making them look like bums. But once he gets going, he's hard to stop. And this this isn't a new thing. From when he was a junior schoolboy he was impossible to keep off. He's been running over people since he was young, you know? I remember I wrote on Facebook about three years ago this month, and I just said, everyone's talking about this boxer, that boxer. Joshua Barnes will be our best British boxer because I've watched him grow in the sport. And honestly, Russ, it would be a special character that takes him round because you'll need a chin and you'll need to have done your, your core work. Because he'll go after everything. Does he beat Callum Johnson? Yep. Does he beat Baturbia? That's too soon. 
He'll wait while he's while he'll wait while he gets old then won't he Baturbia? Different age groups aren't they uh different age groups aren't they? And he, he's only young in he's only just turned twenty six, isn't he? But what's it? Baturbia's 35 next. Yeah. He's just turned 26, hasn't he, uh, Boatsi? He's English yeah. national champion, two year on trot gold medal, gold ma uh, bronze at British, bronze at European, and bronze at Olympics at light heavy, 178 pounds. So he's a big light heavy as well, then, isn't he? Like Andre Ward at 178. Uh, uh, amateur, you know, hundred seventy-eight pound. Yeah. And who did he fight in the Olympics then? Ah, uh, he fought the Dutch guy. The Dutch guy is now ninety-one kilo, and he fought this weekend. And Siobhan Clark beat him. Mullenberg, Peter Mullenberg. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. That's the fight that made him in the Olympics. That, that Mullenberg fight. Because remember, he he dealt with the the African guy early on. Yeah. Uh, it was a Kennedy Katende. Yeah. I'm sure your box record tell us. Yeah. There was Kennedy Katende that he dealt with. Who actually needs the box of Sweden. And Kennedy Katende, interesting fact, well, the reason why Badu Jack didn't box for Sweden and his dead box for Gambia. Because again, Katende is not enough for Jack. Yeah. Hey, a random fact for a Sunday. But no, that Mullenberg fight did it for him because Mullenberg's still a really good amateur now. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's uh he's still going strong him now, Mullenberg, but like I said he looks like he he could uh he could end up going all the way then Boatsy. He's already uh he's already got a got a belt, hasn't it? British light heavyweight, which is you know, a, a class belt, isn't it? British light heavyweight title. Yeah, and and you know, he will he will hold on to that for as long as he wants. I think I think you need world level alone for now. I just think those guys will take years of your career. Let them let them deal with each other and then let them ride up into the sunset. Yeah, I think I think you're right there. I think what he'll do, he'll hover around British level, get the belt outright, and they might even entice Frank Buglioni to come back and fight him. Ah, no, Frank's too comfortable. No chance in hell. They'll dig up someone like a Bob Adams, more likely. It'd be interesting, would not it? But, uh, hmm. Well, moving on then. What did you think to the uh, Eddie Hearn show last night? The Parker show? Parker against Lee P. And I've, I've, seen, I've seen bits of it. And, you know, Parker... Parker's like a... He's like your, your love of Frankie Gavin, right? Yeah. <laughs> but that's never going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Parker's just not a top level guy when there are other top level guys. I don't care what you tell me about the Samoan heritage. He I, look, he laboured to win against the Empire. I saw bits of it. Uh, he looked good in the first round, but then after that he just ran out of ideas. And plus I'm not I'm not really sold on Parker. Neither of us sold on Leah Pai. I thought Leah Pai was sub par when he fought Vladimir, so I was like, Oh God, God help us. And then, who else again? Yeah, Demetrius Andre on there, doing his standard thing of looking good to the hardcores, but utterly boring to the casuals. Well, every time I hear Joseph Parker speak, or Kevin Barry, or any of their teams, the, uh, the, 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 every time they open their mouth to mention Andy Ruiz. Well, they know they didn't really win that fight. Hey? They know they didn't really win that fight. Well, every time they mention it, all the all the talking is about is wanting a rematch. How can you want a rematch when you've won? I know, yeah, but that's what they're, they're wanting the, the, to get the belt back. They want to see his belt back, but it was Tyson's belt, wasn't it? He's on IFL. Yeah. <laughs> he wants his belt back, his WBO belt back. I've bought a Parker, to be honest with you. I have. Including the fact that Parker will fight the winner of and then we'll realize how average Parker is. But I don't think Parker would have ever won the British. I think Dave Allen gives him a good fight if he puts it on him. Yeah. 
he does, Joe Dodge does, Dubois does. A it's, lot of people will give Chuck uh, Parker hell. He stayed out of the way against Joshua and he made it a stinker, didn't he? Yeah, I bet he'll regret that. He'll regret not having a go f going for it like Andy Ruiz, won't he? Yeah. Let's everyone in boxing. When you get your chance, you have a fucking go. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Andy Ruiz, he thought, I've got a golden ticket here and I need to cash it. And he went for it, didn't he? He took Joshua to places he'd never been took before. Now, Parker, looking at his record here... Andy Ruiz uh, was a stone lighter when he fought when he fought him. So if Andy Ruiz comes in in the kind of shape he did against Parker, Joshua's going to be in for a rough night, a very rough night. And one of the judges had it a draw in New Zealand. Which would have been a fair result? Pardon? That would have been a fair result. Yeah, one of them had it a draw, the other two had it by two rounds. So one round off of one judge and it's a draw with other judges as well. Yeah, that would have probably been a fair result. I had it a draw myself, I had it a draw. Uh, uh, but, but Andy Ruiz at the moment, he's got four out of five belts, Terry. Yeah, we should have because there's also scattered too, you know. Who's your top five at the moment uh, in the heavyweights, Terry? In order. Yeah, in order. Wilder, Fury, Joshua, White. And then I have to pull Ortiz at number five. You're not putting Ruiz in the top five? No, because we don't know if that was a fluke or not. After the rematch, absolutely. Yeah. We need to know if that was actually a real performance or not. Yeah, yeah. Unless he was just his Buster Douglas moment. Yeah. Yeah, unless he's going to be consistent. Would Ortiz beat Andy Ruiz? Uh, yeah, he could do. He yeah, I'm not saying he will, but he's got the tools to do it. Mm. All right then. Well, moving on then, right, the Sky contract, Terry, what do you think about Eddie Earns? He's had to cancel the July 5th show, Brian Rose against Fowler. That's going to happen on the 2nd of August now in Liverpool. A coal has been moved to the Dillian White Rivers undercard underneath the Dave Allen Price fight. And then you've got Felix Cash, he's not been given a date, so he's missed out. What do you think to that? and the Sky contract and the fact we had two title fights on last night world title fights in Rhode Island with Cal Gaffey and Andrade uh, so, so first thing as long as we don't have a, a billion dollar war chest all of boxing is going to want to be involved in that I don't think Sky has anywhere near that so Sky kind of has to take a back seat now and just take what they're given because Hearn Hearn is sussed out that he can make all this money with the zone and so why does he really need Sky you know if the zone thing works out Hearn doesn't need Sky mm -hmm. and it now looks like a lot of these fighters the matchroom fighters are not Sky fighters and that Sky don't have fighters they can call on so it's a major screw up on the behalf, behalf of Sky. And so they, they will be doing some soul searching, looking within their own organization and saying, what do we do in 2021? I think you just open up the platform. You think what? Just open up the platform and say, look promoters, you pitch a card to us, if we like it, we'll go with it. Yeah, but do you think if Eddie Earn's still involved, everybody's gonna have to go through a match room to get on Sky, Terry? Uh, I think you've got through Barney. Through Barney Francis. Yeah. If it's a good enough card. Yeah, I think, I, I think that's what it's going to be about from now on. Auditioning to get on Sky. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting times ahead now, isn't it? Because it looks to me like, well, put it, for this, put it this way, right? Eddie's just put two world title fights on in America. One of them were a British kid and his six defence. And, you, and he's just pulled the show, right, next week in Manchester on a sky date. So there's no sky date for that now. So is he, does he get that date back or is he losing dates? Oh, mate, I just remember that you hated the last next-gen show they did. Did I hate what? You hated the last next-gen show they did. There's no winning with you, is there? No, there is, mate. There, there, there is, mate. Honestly, I'm just thinking that he's pulled the show, hasn't he, with Brian Rose and Fowler and, and a Coley were on there and Felix Cash. He's pulled that show in Manchester. I, can't, I just can't understand why, when he said tickets were selling well last week. It wasn't a great show. He, he, he quite right you were getting a stick for that show. It, look, I'll be honest with you, O'Coley's earned the right to be on the pay-per-view card because we talk about how fast Boatsy's rising. Look at how fast O'Coley's rising. Yeah, he's already British in Commonwealth, isn't he? And well ranked. Uh, yeah, I don't know why they're holding O'Coley back. I don't understand that much. I don't, I don't. Is it because he doesn't sell a ticket? Well, at, at that level, he shouldn't have to sell tickets. Yeah, yeah, that's you know, true, that, yeah. Back by AJ, for, for goodness sake, man, where were you in June first? Yeah. How come a Coley weren't on the American show? He hasn't been on any American shows. Do you think Eddie's got cold feet about a Coley? Only fine to AJ Boxing, right? But yeah. he could have been on the Joshua show. There's no, because what was the Hearns thing? The fighters own the budget. Yeah. Which I, which I believe is utter BS. I believe Hearns controls everything. I, I believe the Hearns control everything when it comes to that product. Yeah, I do. What, Joshua? Yeah. I do, yeah. I do, because you know Joshua... There must have come a time when he said, do you know what, Eddie? I want to fight Wilder. And Eddie will have said, no, we've got to keep all your blue chip companies uh, in order because if you get a beat, if you get a loss, your money's going to go down. Look, I don't even think that happened, Bobby. I genuinely think what happened was that 50 million offer was made and Hearn was probably, I don't, know, I don't know if they'd done the zone deal by then, but it was, that can never happen on Showtime. Yeah. And so Hearn was like, nah, it's not happening. Because go back to that interview last year, and I can't remember the date, maybe your hardcore audience can, can put it up in the comments, but there was an interview where Hearn just basically said, look, Matchroom owned Anthony Joshua. And then, then he had to clarify and go, no, no, we just own Anthony Joshua's promotional rights. But I don't understand what that means. What do you mean you own his promotional rights? Yeah, they're getting a cut of all blue chip companies, aren't they? I wouldn't be surprised if they're just eating off Joshua like this. But I imagine a lot of people are eating off Anthony Joshua, and he's probably getting a lot less out of it than we think he is. Probably. You're probably right there, mate. It's like everything centres around Joshua, doesn't it? And to hell with everybody else. Now, them fighters that have pish, pitched their hooks with Joshua, Boatsy and Akoli, they must be worried now. Uh, they're talented enough that they're valuable. Yeah. I think they're all right, but those other people in the photographs and you know, in the videos, they must be worried for their jobs. They must be because there'll be people, right, who, who, who are gutted Joshua's been beaten at Sky because if he gets beat again, heads are going to roll. Now, I don't see McCracken being in a job if he gets beat again and he wants to fight again. I see McCracken going because uh, he'll have had a, a lot longer to prepare for Ruiz this time. What if Ruiz comes out better than ever? I hope he does. Uh, many, many Robles as trainer is saying, look, there's a lot more work we can do with Andy. So, wow, I hope so. So if he comes out better than ever, I mean, Joshua, so it might all come flashing back to him when he gets it ring with him. 
It's going to be an interesting rematch, Terry, if it happens this year, isn't it? So look, I, I have this belief in life, in, in very true boxing. Everyone breaks at some point. Whether yeah. you call it quitting or whether you call it breaking mentally, it doesn't matter. So Ara Davis broke against Josh Taylor. Joshua broke against Andy Ruiz. And everyone does it once in their life. But normally you do it away from the public. So I've seen kids do it in the gym. I've seen kids do it at shows in the amateurs. And you allow that one, that one time where you just, you just break mentally and you go, I can't do this. If you do it again, it becomes a pattern. But most people go, I never want to feel like that again. And they'll never do it again. So we'll see what Joshua's got in it. If he, if he falls again, then I don't, I don't see him coming back. If he can, even if he loses through Ruiz, but if he fights back and looks strong, he can easily come back. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're right, yeah. Right then. Well, let's finish up on uh, Spencer Fearon's big interview on IFL about diversity in boxing. What do you think to that, Terry? Russ, who are your five favourite boxers? Five favourite boxers of all time? Yeah. Uh, Ali, uh, Frotch, Ryan Rhodes, uh, you know, uh, I liked Lennox Lewis, I liked Jerry Cooney, Larry Holmes, them guys, them sort yeah. of guys. So, so you notice know, you know, in that list, that's quite a mixed group in terms of backgrounds and ethnicity. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, who runs boxing? Who runs boxing? Okay. In England, well, do you mean, do you mean, well he's had a go Spencer at Sky and Matchroom for not employing uh, people of ethnic minorities, hasn't he? Well, but, it's a boxing problem, so how can it be that there are so many black fighters in the sport that do well as boxers? Yeah. And they all seem to disappear after the sport. They get wheeled out when there's a live event just to add credibility to it. But they're not, they're, they're never given good fighters to train, they're yeah. never allowed to promote, they're never allowed to, I mean like, apart from Johnny Nelson really, you know, you don't get, Johnny Nelson and David A are the ones that they'll wheel out, like, it, there's, a, there's a race problem in boxing that no one talks about, that yeah. that's what I'll put, I'll put it out there like that, and rest assured, if a black promoter showed up in the UK with money, they'd do everything they could to make sure he left, minus his money. Do you reckon, yeah? Like, yeah, look at the shit out Heyman got for years. And Heyman had to show up and go, look how much money I've made for these music stars. So all the fights are signed with him to the point where you just had to do business with Al Heyman even when you didn't want to. Yeah. Do you think that Bob Arum and your Barry Earns and them, do you think they're stuck in a rut? I think they're, they're frightened by change. I think they recruit people who are they feel comfortable around who are familiar who are like them yeah and so if you're a young black anything you're a young black matchmaker trainer you struggle yeah you think you, you can on one hand you can name the black head trainer in British boxing on one hand Pat Barrett Don Charles rest in Johnny people. Roy Johnny Roy from Preston, he's making his way, yeah. is he? Yeah, and he's got the MTK backing. MTK. But then you start to struggle. Pardon? Uh, maybe Brian Lawrence. Uh, Don uh, Charles. Yeah, I mentioned him earlier, but oh, that's yeah. pretty much it. And like, now you look at those guys, they've never had a GB lad ever handed to them. No, they haven't, have they? No, not one GB lad. Or lad, none of them. Do you think Spencer might have uh, might be coming to end with his job at Sky why he's made that bold statement in that interview? No, so, so I think people people need to understand Spencer Fearon, right? Spencer's yeah. been involved in boxing since before we were probably watching it. Yeah. Right? He has every right. Like Spencer Spencer's seen a lot. Like 
I, I cringe at some of the stuff he says. I, I, I've said that to him before. It's, it's cringeworthy. Yes. You know, work together in the wrong sequence, trying to sound clever, or he'll insert himself into a story that's got nothing to do with him. He's best friends with everyone in Boston, allegedly. But he serves his time in the sport. No one can tell him to get out of the sport. Mm. Because he's been there. Young amateur boxer, schoolboy boxer, junior boxer, senior amateur, pro, sparring partner, has been on big shows before. Was promoted by Dennis, wasn't he, for a bit? Yeah, Dennis promoted him, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, what more does he have to do to, for his opinion in the sport to be valid? He's trained people as well. Yeah, managed and promoted. Yeah, he's done everything in boxing. So, he has to stay at the table. But sometimes he talks out of his ass. And, you, and all we need to do is just let him know, mate, you're talking out your ass on this one. Yeah, he does rub people up wrong way with his. Uh, he 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 strikes me as a self promoter. I think he's promoting himself more than diversity. Do you know what I mean? I think he more or less promotes himself. That's my opinion, anyway. It's not, I'm not the only person who thinks that as well. But uh, but good luck to him. In life, just in general, because I don't like hearing people in boxing struggle. So as long as he's not struggling, it's okay. Yeah, he's wait. He's on. He's on books at Sky. He's doing all right, isn't he? He's, do, so he's doing okay. Well, listen. It's been great talking to you, Terry. We've had a good. We've had a good hour and fifteen minutes. We've had a good chat. Uh, great, lads. great lads, aren't we? And you're coming up hey, next Friday. Go shout out Chris Medley. I can do every Sunday. We always give Chris Medley a shout out, don't we? Yeah, I've got, I've got love for Chris Medley. They're a living legend. One of the best trainers this country has very yeah. much underappreciated what's yeah. more with Caldwell stable than five days Caldwell is my opinion yeah he's, ty he's tiling on a tiling job today Chris ah oh, man trying to get a few quid on a Sunday bless him ah oh, man he does there's a guy who deserves to be treated better by boxing yeah the, do you know what for every Dave Caldwell, there's a Spe there's a Chris Smedley, isn't there? You know, them who are pe the, there's people who are slick in boxing who get on, and there's people who are better trainers and they don't are slick and they don't get on. And it's just how it goes, isn't it? So, look, uh, so boxing, yeah. you're often faced with a choice, right? Yeah. This is how this is how it was explained to me by one of the big promoters. Mm. Boxing's like this trade. You can't steer it left, you can't steer it right, it just goes in a straight line. Yeah. Now, where it goes might not be where you want to go to, so you've got to ask yourself, do I want to jump on this train? What you can't do is get on the train and say you need to change direction. And that's what I was told, that like, you've got to just play the game. Yeah, I don't play the game, me. I just fucking jump in feet first, don't I? Whereas I have Dennis behind me saying, what are you going to do that for? I say, because I fucking don't like him. He'll go, no, no, you can't be doing that. You've got to bite your tongue and just let it happen. He says, it's how it, I, we might need them down the line. Now I'm going to have to go fucking undo all that you've done now. <laughs> now I'm going to have to go fucking smooth it all now, what you've just done. I say, so fucking what? Fuck him. But yeah, I see where you're coming from. Yeah, but for us, for, like in your case, Russ, right, there's got to come a point when you say, I want to help a few fighters out, right? Yeah. And it's going to mean you, it's going to mean you shutting up, it's going to mean you apologising to a few people to get deals done. Yeah, you're probably right. You don't know who you're going to bump into. You know the number of times I've had fallouts with people in boxing, right? True, that Denny, that's what Dennis used to say that to me. Once you're out, you're, you're out and there's no way back unless you get a, a stroke of luck. And once you're in, you're in, you have to hold it with both hands. You're either depressed, eating yourself to death, 
Like Dave Allen, what, 12 months ago, all of a sudden now Dave's looking at buying his fifth house. So good luck to him. Yeah, he's doing well, David. He's buying houses up around the village. He's got houses. He's, 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 the, he's going to be known as the landlord, the white rhino landlord. <laughs> Fuck knows what happened to Rhino Sand. He's what his gym. I don't know what happened yeah. to that. I don't know. It was on. It was in Balby somewhere in his gym. I don't know if he got it. I don't know if he finished it. I know they started work on it. I don't know. I don't know. You know, good luck to good luck to Dave. But I think the key thing I wanted to say was you're lucky you got someone like Dan next to you, man. Yeah, I know. There's a guy that gets the game. I, I honestly wish. Guy says, Look, Dennis, we see a place for you at Sky Sports Boxing doing XYZ. Because once they do that, Dan can they get the fight if you want. Yeah, that's it. You can you can get them on you can go get you're not having to get people ooh no disrespect at fighters Dennis has got, but they're not kids that are turning over with amateur rec with good uh, G B team records, are they? He's getting kids that I've already won titles and lost titles and won and lost and it'd be nice for a Dennis to get a, a, some lads who have got a bit of GB experience, wouldn't it, you know, when they're starting out? Well, not even that, so Dennis' challenge is this. Are you a promoter that manages or manager that promotes? Because if you are, then you're going to have to go Yeah. So he needs to decide, am I, is the future for Dennis Hobson management or promotion? If it's management, you go right. If I can't get the best of GB, I must be able to get the best of everywhere else. And he's not on this. Yeah, you're probably, you're, you're probably right there, well. We're going to see, but like I said, it's starting out next Friday, Josh Whale, Commonwealth Eliminator. Uh, Tommy Frank, Commonwealth Defence, and Tyrone Nurse fighting at welterweight. So it's all all going to start next week, isn't it? Why didn't Tyrone Nurse fight Chris Conger? Hey? Why didn't Tyrone Nurse fight Chris Conger? I don't know, mate. I'll find out when I see him this week on Wednesday. Yeah, like, like I can't take him seriously if he doesn't make fight on that fight. Is that a good fight, Terry? That? Yeah, but here's the thing, look. Him putting out that fight. Chris spent all that money on camp, and now he's like, yo, I, I've got no food. Oh, I didn't know that, mate. So, so someone has to make it right, because I'm hearing Tyrone Nurse, oh, Colin said, no, 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 Tyrone Nurse, don't fight Chris Conlon. Mm. That's the honour of being a fighter. You've got, you've got to help people provide for their families. Yeah, well, I'll mention that this week to him, and uh, I'll see if we can get a response, because do you think that's a good fight on one of Dennis's shows for September? September? Is he? Is he? Is he extra QB? Him, yeah. Chris Conlon, ex QB, went to tournaments with GB. He's got the tracks with everything. He he beat Serge Alfonso as well. Come to me. I like him, Serge. I like Serge. I like the fact that he's kicked the alcohol habit as well. So fair yeah. play. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That. Nice guy, man. Really, really nice guy. He's he's a good guy, him. Ben, ben should have signed him. Oh, uh, Chris, yeah, did you surge? Yeah. Well, didn't, didn't, didn't AJ have him? Because he fought, uh, Jerome. He fought Jerome, didn't he? And uh, he beat him. And uh, AJ well, Obson. Was he with Glen Rhodes? Yeah, he might have been with Glen Rhodes, yeah. I think AJ, AJ and Glen Rhodes had him. And they said, no, you don't want him at rematch. He's punching harder than ever. So Colwell rematched him. And Jerome got an head injury, didn't he? Yeah, okay. And I remember seeing it to Glenn about it. And Glenn was like, Carl, like, what happened with Fred? He's like, ah, oh, mate, he's fallen in love with the Western way of life. He's just gone mental with it. Yeah, he's alright as well, Serge. Like, nice kid. Great guy. Man. Him and Thomas is. You have know, what you had on his shoulder. The guy's just made of marble. The guy is, mate. He's, he's like that guy out at Fantastic Four. You know he made out of tarmac. He's always with Thomas the Somber. Uh, you know what? They were friends of mine. So remember when they did a runner? 
from Olympics. Olympics. Yeah. <laughs> they, came, they came to train with us for three months. Is that while yeah. they were going pleading asylum? Yeah, so we had them in our gym for three months. It was big blade lender, Thomas Asopa, a guy called Christian Don Frank, who was late in the city of that, and Serge and Bob was in there as well. There was one other guy who I forget. But, but absolutely no English. But they were amazed with the, with the guys we had in the gym. They were just great, great sparring guys, man. Just class act. Like really, they're, they're, they're guys that what we will, will be cool forever in a day. Yeah, well, I, I like that Thomas Asomber. I've actually been uh, Jaffa give me a lift because he took him on, didn't he, Phil Jeffries, Thomas? Yeah. And he, he gave me me and my mate Pat a lift from Dennis's place to uh, to Arena. I think he went Magna when he fought one of Dennis's lads, and. Uh, me and Thomas were sat at the back of this Black Range over about 100 mile an hour down Attercliffe and I says, uh, alright Thomas, he says yes, says, does he always drive like this Phil? He says yes, he's a crazy driver. <laughs> but yeah, he's alright Tom. Thomas is alright, he's got a good record Thomas. Is he still with Jaffa? No idea. Let's have a look at his record. So well, look, here, Thomas is somber. He's our eight, man. He's our he's eight. He's, uh, he's 30 year old, hang on. Have a look. Thomas. Thomas is somber. How do you spell a somber, Terry? E double S O M B A. E double S? Yeah. O M B A. A somber. Oh, Thomas is somber, eight and five. Yeah. Eight and five, yeah. Is that all he is, eight and five? Isn't he? He's been a Commonwealth champion, hasn't he? Oh. Walid Din, October 2015, when he, when he fought. Walid Din, that's the first time I met Thomas. And him and Jaffa wouldn't have a bet, because he, 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 he backed him to win, didn't he, Jaffa? Thomas, yeah. and uh, I think I think him and Dennis did have a bet actually. I think they had a bet on that. Uh, but that deal was done on a handshake. That show, that was done on a handshake. But since then, he's been beat by Ian Butcher on points in Edinburgh, Kyle Williams and Lee McGregor. Yeah, he's moved up in weight. Yeah, yeah, he moved up on it. He moved up to uh, to a super fly, wasn't he? No, he's actually a flyweight, and he's fighting the bantamweight. Yeah, he's fighting it wrong weight, isn't he? Yeah, he got beat by Jay Harris as well. That was a close one, though. That at your he's call, Olympian. eh? He's a Olympian. Yeah, good little fighter. He's still active, though. He hadn't fought for about eight months. And he's uh, just turned 31. Tommy's a super fly, isn't he? Why you make that fun? Yeah, well, it was mentioned recently, but uh, it just depends if Thomas can get to 118, doesn't it? Well, no, no, well, you said he's super fly. That's 115. Yeah, sorry, 115, sorry. Yeah, well, he'd have to take three pound off, wouldn't he, sorry? Yeah. Tommy's a super fly, isn't he? That's easy, Hey? Thomas is a full guy next to me. Is he? Yeah. That's a good fight, that actually. He might have a bit more experience on Tommy Frank, though. Let's have a look. Yep. Superfly it's Tommy 115. Blood, blood, blood. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to see it. I wanted to see Sonny Edwards fight, but Dennis says next year for that. And Dennis has bumped into Sonny today. And in 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 uh, park and he didn't say anything. I wore it yesterday. I think it might have been yesterday actually. I think he bumped. Let's find the Edwards fight at Sombra as well. Let, let, you know, Edwards stop swerving Thomas to Sombra. Yeah, there's a good little round robin there, isn't there? Yeah. And winner of them three can fight Charlie Edwards. Oh, that'd be a, that'd be really good. Yeah. 
So, brilliant. Well, Tommy's ranked uh, number four in Britain. Let's have a look. I don't think Thomas is in these rankings. Now, you've got Cal Yafai number one at Superfly, Sonny Edwards two, uh, Ryan Farag three, Tommy Frank four, Craig Derbyshire five. So, Sonny's number two, 11 and 0, Tommy's 10 and 0. And uh, they're both similar age, aren't they? There's 18 months between them. So, one's got, I think Tommy's got Commonwealth, Sonny's fighting for the vacant IBF international belt against Hiram Gallardo at Greenwich on 13th of July. 13th of July. So that'll be on a Frank Warren show, won't it? Is that the Gorman show? Or July 13th, yeah. July 13th, Joe Joyce, Bryant Jennings, uh, Liam Williams, Karam Ancor, Dubai Gorman, Sonny Edwards, Gallardo, Archie Sharp, Jordan McCurry. Fucking hell, that's a right show, that. Willie Hutchinson's on there as well. Dennis McCann. That is a good show, that. That's probably a show at year, that. That's a good show, that, Terry. That is that is a very good show that 13th of July two week away at the O2 Frank Warren Queens Queensby Promotions ESPN USA BT Sport Joe Joyce Bryant Jennings Liam Williams Caraman Core Will Boxing's Council Silver Belt Middleweight title They'll be slipping him in for Canelo soon, him, Liam Williams. Dubois Gorman's a great fight, isn't it? 11 and 0 and 16 and 0. Great. Sonny Edwards against Erem Gallardo. These are good fights, these. Look at Archie Sharp against Jordan McCory. That's a great little fight, that. Yeah, who wants to win the card? Hey, well, uh, Areem Shiraz, 8 and 0 against TBA. Uh, sorry, Amza Shiraz. Willie Hutchinson, 8 0. He's fighting Joseph Perkovic, I've not heard of him. Dennis McCann, he's a novice, he's undefeated. He's, like, he's being really highly talented at the moment. Really Dennis talented. McCann? Yeah. Mm. He's the Dennis the Menace from Kent, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, being played by a friend of mine. Yeah, For Florian Marco, 3 0, against T. Eh? So he's the, the Albanian with the crazy fan base. Yeah. Rick might kick off on that one. Florian, uh, sorry, Jonathan Palater, uh, 5 and 0. Jack. Heavyweight in the world. Yeah, yeah. The, the best what? The best heavyweight in the world. You reckon? <laughs> Jake Petit, 5 and 0, Super Feather. Mark Chamberlain, lightweight, 2 and 0. And Mickey Burke making his debut. Mickey Burke Jr. So his dad, Mickey Burke, aka Mickey and Jen, is, yeah, they all train out at a gym called Ironbox in Kent. Yeah, Bexley. Yeah. Bexley yeah. Eve. Yeah. But like I said, uh, you've got how many fights you got there? Two, four, six, eight, ten. Thirteen fights on there. Thirteen fights. Two week. Forty quid a ticket. That'd be a good good night, that. Sixty quid for your beer money. Hundred quid, that's a good night out, that. That is, a, that is a porky type night out. That's a porky type. could if it could end up, it could end up a two hundred quid night out if it were me. We're twenty pound taxi and uh, a few extras. <laughs> that could. Sure, that French card is probably the second biggest card this year after July fifth at Pond's Forge. Yeah, after the July fifth at, to at Pond's Forge, Sheffield, it's the second best card of the yeah. year. But I tell you what, right, he's come out fighting Frank in the last six months, hasn't he? Yeah, because he knows that uh, week in the UK. Yeah, well, like I said, Joe Joyce and Bryant Jennings, Dubois and Gorman, you've got two real 50-50 fights there. I'd say Joyce is a favourite against Bryant Jennings, but it's not nailed on. The other one's a 50-50. Hey? If he's not on his game, he gets beat, Joe Joyce. Liam Williams is in a cracker, let me tell you. That's a cracker, that. Liam Williams has won against Angkor. 
it's a good little fight that French kid that's a good little fight that he went 12 rounds with David Lemieux last year didn't you know that and I caught uh, yeah he went 12 rounds with Lemieux so if he can get through David Lemieux for 12 rounds Liam Williams if he stops him that's a right statement isn't it so that's a good show that from Frank Warren. I'm impressed. He's actually impressing me, old fish eyes. He's impressing me. I'm I'm impressed. What do you think, Terry? That's it. That's it. Good card. Are you gonna go? Um, I'm talking to JP now to give me some decent tickets because he's boxing on the show. So like, give me some tickets, mate. Eh? Oh, John Jonathan Palater. Yeah. Oh, do you know Jonathan then? Yeah. I used to train him. All right then. Well, he's from your neck at Woods, Sydenham, London. Yeah, I wanted Dennis to find him at one point, but Dennis was like, "You want to sell any tickets up here?" I was like, "Don't worry about tickets, man. Just, 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 just put money into this kid." Well, he's going to end up regretting that. Then the dancing destroyer. I would. I think we're changing the name. We're changing the nickname. He's changing it to uh, the greatest heavyweight ever. Nah, nah, the most athletic heavyweight ever. Yeah, well, he's uh, he's already right. He's already stopped Dean Wingrove at your call. Yeah, there you go. There you go. He's got a, he's got a decent knockout on his record as well. There and, and the kid's done no since. The kid yeah, made his right. debut and got iced. So yeah. good good luck. Good luck to JP then. Well, I hope you enjoy that, Terry. But like I said, I'll see you next week. Are you coming up on the Friday tea time? Uh, mate, once I, once I wake up, I'll leave. I don't know what time that will be. Right then, all right. Well, listen, give me a ring when you're close to getting off train and I'll come and pick you up then Friday, yeah? All right. All right, lad, right, lad. All right, yeah. I'll take you and see Liam Cannonball. We'll have a quick chat with Liam before we go see Dennis. Oh, you like that, wouldn't you? <laughs> nah, I've got a lot of time for you. Alright then, mate. Well, listen, all the best, Teddy. Thanks for coming on channel. Alright, mate. And I'll speak to you soon. Cheers, pal. Alright, bye. Right, bye. That's Terry Chapandama. Good friend of mine. Good friend of Dennis's. He's always at the end of the phone when Dennis needs a bit of advice. He's say, Ross, can you. Uh, can you go and ask uh, Terry what he thinks to this? Right, lad, Terry. Uh, but yeah, he's a good, good. Uh, I'd say Terry's an amateur specialist who fumbled his way into professional rank. <laughs> but uh, but he does. He is a good guy to be in with, and he's loyal as well. And that, we like loyalty up here. We like loyalty and Terry's not shy to gut bar, which a lot of people who tend to knock about with me, they go missing when it's time to go to the bar. They seem to go absent without leave. But it is what it is, isn't it? So I just want to point out to so anybody who's out there and they want to they want to buy some socks. You want to go to More Mile New York Running Socks. I've been wearing them and my feet are comfy, my feet feel really comfy. There's two things in life you've got to get right in your life. And that is a good mattress on your bed. If you can, if you're lucky enough and you can get a mattress for your bed if you spend a lot of time in bed like me. Go and get a good mattress, don't matter what it costs, I'm not talking a couple hundred quid when I'm talking a good one. Get a good mattress and good socks and then you're set up for life. So, but it is what it is. But yeah, I enjoyed that. Uh, I don't agree 100% with him on Spencer Fearing. I don't want to turn my telly on and every time I see Spencer Fear and him bleating on about the same old thing but I do think that there is a problem and I've asked Rico his opinion he agrees with me that Spencer does go on a bit about it and I've asked Terry and they're both black men and 
So I've asked them, they're my pals, and they've both got different opinions on it. But Spencer Fearon, yeah, and maybe I have been a bit harsh on Spencer Fearon. He has done his time in boxing, hasn't he? But then again, so's Dave Colwell, hasn't he? He's done. He, he's been in, around boxing game. He's done it. He's had his time, hasn't he? But like I said, there's arse lickers in boxing, and there's people that are straight, straight goers. When I talk straight goers, I like to think people like myself. Mick Whale, Chris Smedley, people that are not there with hand out, and then you have other people that seem to have hand out all the time, whether it's for grants, for this, or wanting that, or want, wanting to be on fucking board this, or blah de blah that, and kissing ass. I ain't got time for kiss asses in boxing industry. I like real men around me. I like real men like Dennis Hobson, Clinton Woods, Mark Tibbs, Jimmy Tibbs. I like I like to think that I can send them sort of people a text every now and then and have a crack. You know what I mean? Proper men. Proper men's men. You know what I mean? I was going to say proper people who, call, who, who say it as, as they are. There's too many kiss asses. You know what I mean? There's too many Eddie Hearn kiss asses. There's too many people getting press passes with fucking YouTube cameras who don't know fuck all about boxing. You know what I mean? They're prepared to say nice things about Eddie Hearn. Listen, Frank Warren's putting a cracker show on on July 13th. I've never been a big Frank Warren fan. Not for the last five years, but that show has topped anything that Eddie Hearn's put on this year. Anything. He's topped all of his shows. That is a good value for money. It's not a pay-per-view show. Is there a better show this year than Frank Warren's that's non-pay-per-view than this O2 show? No, I don't think there is. I think that's the best show this year from January. Probably even going back to Christmas or even beginning at season in September. So I want to say, well done, Frank Warren. And normally I give you a bit of stick, don't I, old fish eyes? I know you're listening. I usually give him stick, I usually give that, uh, what's he called? He was usually sat on his on his shoulder, that mascot, Andy Aylin, he usually gave him a bit of stick. Uh, but a good show, that. Good show, that. and I hope Frank Warren keeps that up, because I've seen this before with Frank, where every now and then he slips a good one in, and then we have a couple of crap ones. Let's hope that he builds on this and gets Tyson Fury Wilder on. Because the winner of that is the man. Because at the moment it's to and fro in all the time, isn't it? Who's the man? And we just can't decide, can we? So, it is what it is. My top five heavyweights at the moment <laughs> changes by the day. If Dillian White smashes up rivers inside three rounds, I'll be like Frank Buglione. Oh, it's Dillian White who's the best. So I don't know, but I think they're all a bit. I think it's all evening up. But they've got to fight each other now. We've got to have a round robin of fights. They've got to sit down with big promoters and all be paid handsomely for the for the work they're gonna put in, for the work they will put in. Should I say? I want to see Dillian White against Tyson Fury. I want to see it twice. I want to see Joshua against Ruiz rematch, I want to see Joshua against White rematch I want to see Joshua Parker in a rematch I want to see Tyson Fury Parker a couple of times, I want to see Tyson Dillian a couple of times I want to see Ortiz fight Tyson Fury, Dillian White, Joshua, I don't want to see him fight him in another five years when he's 50 I want to see him fight now you know, I think the Joshua here has come to an end. It'll be my worst nightmare if Joshua beats Andy Ruiz. It will be my worst nightmare. Because then we'll be back to, well, he just had a blip on that night and it were a fluke and now he's got his game together and he's back where he belongs at number one and all that shit. When truth be known is I've been telling people for ages, so's Terry, so's Rico. Joshua is hiding glass. He's got more glass in his jaw than a chandelier. Do you know what I mean? He should be sponsored by fucking Everest double glazing and auto windscreens. 
you know what I mean so I don't really know my top five is it fluctuates but if you're gonna go by the norm you're gonna go Tyson Fury one Wilder one then you're gonna go Ruiz three Joshua four White five Ortiz six that's my top six did I say top five or top well that's well you're gonna have Tyson and Wilder as one aren't you right then you're gonna have Ruiz two Joshua two them two have got to fight it, there's so many permutations it's a fucking nightmare you know you're left open to scrutiny and everything if we say Tyson Fury is the best the naysayers are going to say well he's only got one world title win and that were over a guy in his 40th year four year ago but then the Tyson Fury Fury power Fury power the Fury power group are going to say he beat Vladimir and he was the man. But yeah, it was four years ago though. Since then he's been on his ass twice, hasn't he Tyson? Been on his hands and knees twice since then. Against a guy who was technically awful. So he said he went out boxing him. So they gave that as a draw so he's got one title win. And then if you're going to say Wilder's the best. Well, he's had like ten title fights and he winning nine. But who has he beat? He beats Tavern twice. And that's it. He's not beating another champion, has he? That's it. And Drew with Fury and other seven. Who were other seven? Yeah, you could say Luis Ortiz. A better promoter would have had him upgraded to regular champion from interim champion. So, yeah, that were a life and death with Ortiz. A man that Fury didn't want to fight. In his interview with Ingram Jones, he said that. He said he's in the Unisim club. And Joshua didn't want to fight Ortiz, but Wilder iced him and he's going to come back and fight him again. So if Wilder beats Ortiz, he's going to be the definite number one, isn't he? In my opinion, definito number one. So, that's just how I look at it. But at the moment, you'd have to put them neck and neck, Fury and Wilder at the top. Then you say it's between Ruiz and Joshua who wins rematch for the second place but that's your top four at the moment isn't it Wilder Fury, Ruiz, Joshua them four are your main men after them four you've got Dillian White and Ortiz they're in like the next batch aren't they and then you'd have to say Joe Joyce wouldn't you in that Kaunaki is it you'd have to put them in Yui would probably be in your top 15 wouldn't he at the moment, you is 24, he's three years younger than Dave Allen, there's no rush. But it is what it is, isn't it? It's one of them things. So, alright, peace out, keep on trucking, keep supporting boxing. Uh, hopefully, this will go out before Friday, and if there's any straddlers out there and they want to go to a good boxing show on Friday, come to Dennis Hobson's show at the Ponds Ford in Sheffield I'll be there from 8 o'clock 8pm we're taking my seat entering the building at 8pm and I'll be leaving about 11pm to go out on the town a few beers in Maggie Mays I think so peace out keep on trucking <laughs>